My name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number seven, with my guest today, Dorolo Nixon. Hello, Dorolo. Hi, Hassan. How are you? Great. Calpurnia. Peace ho. Caesar speaks. Calpurnia. Hear my lord. Stand you directly in Antonius' way when he doth run his course. Antonius. Caesar, my lord. Forget not your speed, Antonius. To touch Calpurnia, for our elders say the baron touched in this holy chase shake off their sterile curse. I shall remember. When Caesar says, do this, it is performed. Set on and leave no ceremony out. Caesar! Ha! Who calls? Bid every noise be still. Peace yet again. Who is it in the press that calls on me? I hear a tongue shriller than all the music cry, Caesar! Speak! Caesar is turned to hear. Beware the Ides of March. What man is that? A soothsayer bids you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Fellow, come from the throng. Look upon Caesar. What sayest thou to me now? Speak once again. Beware the Ides of March. He is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Pass. Beware the Ides of March. The man in question had been blind from birth. Then one day, out of the clear blue sky, he was selected to see. His eyes were opened, and then that's when all the trouble began. He was asked to justify himself, justify his healing, justify the miraculous. His parents abandoned him, as often happens in cases like this, and the community rejected him. Wondering why, he questioned whether the community was ready to believe, not in him or the miraculous restoration of sight, but instead believe in the person who sent him. They rejected him, of course, the community, his family, and then they even rejected the message of the one who restored his sight. Throughout history, willful, obstinate blindness has destroyed more leadership in the cradle and in the real than any other leadership dysfunction. If leaders are willfully blind, they are self-deceived. If leaders allow others to blind them, they are irresponsible. And if leaders follow along with the blindness of the crowd, well, then they're merely sophisticated followers. There are many obvious problems beyond the mere fallacious that we can list with being a blind leader, but the most consequential result of leadership blindness is the inability to recognize and hold back the forces of chaos. You know, those forces cemented into ritual, cemented into literature, from Brutus, <laughs> who we're going to talk about today, to the carnival of hyenas following Scar around in the Lion King. You know, the ones that proclaimed, no king, no king, tra-la-la-la-la. What is it that Scar said at the end of that? Oh yeah, that's right. Idiots, there will be a king. I will be king. Stick with me, and you'll never be hungry again. Such forces of chaos rely on blindness. Weakness, apathy, and most of all, forgetfulness. Look, a leader's fundamental skill set is to avoid blindness. And this is a leadership podcast. And so we're going to talk about avoiding blindness today, but also to avoid the seduction to become blind at all costs. The leader who leads best leads with their eyes wide open. The leader who leads the most courageously is the one whose eyes are opened, even if they have been previously shut. For, much like the blind man, 
All they know for sure is that once upon a time they might have been blind. But now, now they see. And hopefully, hopefully right on time. Our guest today, Dorolo Nixon, is not only a partner in our business, HSCT Publishing, you know, the publishing company that's wrapped around this leadership consultancy that's then wrapped around this podcast, but also he's an avid reader, um, a politico, uh, a debater, uh, at least with me anyway, um, around leadership, development, business, entrepreneurship, life, culture, um, the vagaries of being black, being politically conservative um, in a world, oh, and also being a Christian in a world where all of those things don't always line up very neatly. Or at all. Or at all sometimes, that's right. When leaders are legally blind, people like DeRolo help them see. But sometimes leaders walk into blindness with their eyes wide open and they aren't even remotely aware for all of their power and influence what they should be actually seeing. Welcome to the podcast today, DeRolo. Thank you for having me this morning, Hayson. Would you like to add anything to that rousing open? We, we opened with Shakespeare and a few of my own thoughts, but would you, would you like to add anything to that rousing open? I would. Um, your astute comments beg the question, what blinds our leaders? I think you've hit the nail on the head that uh, blindness, which of course is another way of saying lack of vision, is both the first and the most fundamental problem leadership that has to be overcome. So what blinds our leaders? What should followers do once they realize that the driver is asleep at the wheel, as it were, and either the ship of state, the ship of family, the ship of an enterprise is going to go over a cliff unless something be done. And of course, um, these or similar thoughts to these perhaps uh, could have gone through the head of Brutus, Marcus Brutus, as Shakespeare wrote him. Uh, not the actual Roman, but the Roman on stage could have gone through his mind if he weren't blind himself. Um, so yes, what what is it that blinds our leaders? Is it one thing? Is it several things? Is it always a combination of certain things? Good question. Excellent questions. And on this podcast, we do talk about the intersections of leadership, <clears throat> perhaps maybe not as uh, perhaps not as uh, broadly, but we're, we're well, I would say maybe not as broadly, perhaps not as uh, organically in all of those areas as in state, family and enterprise. But I like how you broke that down because leadership does exist in all areas. And, you know, we've talked about how. Uh, in our episode on 100 Years of Solitude, which I'll reference again later on, we talked about how in uh, Garcia Gabriel Marquez's great book, basically family is, is the ship of state in that book. <laughs> um, in the Iliad, we talked about, you know, Homer and Homer's perspective on the ship of state um, with the ship of state being focused around honor. Uh, one thing I want to get off the get off the, the to, to a running start on right now is is this idea of Shakespeare. So let's talk a little bit about Shakespeare, right? So I'm reading from today, Julius Caesar, um, the Folger Library edition of Julius Caesar. You can go and pick that up anywhere. <clears throat> I won't have links in the chat because you can just go Google it. Um, Shakespeare's hard. <laughs> Shakespeare's hard to get through for people. Shakespeare's hard to make interesting. Uh, we're going to try to make it interesting on this podcast today. Um, Talk to me a little bit, or let, let's talk a little bit. Let's start with that idea of Shakespeare, right? Because, and we're going to revisit this idea again, but I'll, I'll punt it up early. Shakespeare was really good at taking uh, dramatic uh, historical events, in, and, and, and probably his, his pinnacle of this is Julius Caesar, but taking dramatic historical events out of history and putting them into myth. Um, there's a lot of the lines that we have tattooed on the back of our shirts, uh, tattooed on our bodies that we say in our common parlance, for instance, beware the eyes of March that come out of Caesar. And yet most, there are generations of high school students that hate Shakespeare, <laughs> generations of college students that hate Shakespeare and generations of adults that wouldn't go watch a Shakespeare movie if you paid them. So let's talk about Shakespeare for just a minute. 
We know that he was a real person and not from the movie Shakespeare in Love. We know that he was a real person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we know that he really existed. We know that he really wrote uh, and that he was he was collating a bunch of a number of ideas together. What impact has Shakespeare had on your life and on your experience um, as a barrister, as a lawyer, as a person who is not only seeking to make the world right through the law, um, but also has a not only a, an understanding of the dramatic, but understanding of how all these things click together. Contextualize Shakespeare for us a little bit. Let's start off with that idea. Um, yes, absolutely. So it's fascinating. The Bard of Avon, Stratford upon Avon, uh, certainly existed. I think we should address that point uh, immediately. There are several, there were several, excuse me, contemporaries of Shakespeare who wrote about Shakespeare, not just um, their own works. For example, the poet Ben Jonson, um, Johnson with no H, and Ben, apparently not Benjamin, but the poet Ben Jonson, who did a very good job um, praising his contemporary and acknowledging the superiority of Shakespeare. At the same time, he could still rib him over certain points. And of course, Shakespeare would give back uh, as good as he can, as good as he could. Um, but, you know, moving further in time until today, I don't think Shakespeare can be avoided because not only did he have um, a permanent and a pervasive impact on the English language, arguably he had the most permanent and pervasive impact on the English language in the last thousand years. Mm -hmm. um, if someone were to that. rebut that and they were to say, well, let's take the King James Bible, did that have a greater impact? Yes, however, it and its language would not have existed the way they did without Shakespeare, I would argue. Um, just to give you um, a sampling, the following words exist in English because of Shakespeare, either creating them or using them in a way that henceforth they are now continually being used. Accommodation, assassination, dexterously, dislocate, indistinguishable, obscene, the next word hopefully is not fitting here, pedant, uh, <laughs> premeditated, premeditated, premeditated. Um, it's December 9, 2021. If we back up a month ago, there was something going on, not just in the social media sphere, but in a courtroom in the Midwest of the United States of America. And perhaps the word premeditated was bandied about during mm. those proceedings by mm. lawyers other than me. Mm -hmm. uh, reliance submerged Shakespearean, the genius of Stratford upon Avon. Uh, and part of his genius, I remember from high school, it being, you know, taught to me. Um, but let, let me back up. So I went to a public high school and turned around and went to an Ivy League school. And I have a degree in English literature from Cornell University. Um, I Cornell. remember... Thank you. Yes, yes. Cornell. Yes. <laughs> Some of us have heard of Cornell University. Others right. of us worked down the street from Cornell University. I'll just leave that alone for just a minute. <laughs> you know, I ran down the street once. Yeah. Um, yeah in in yeah. one of my Byronic moments, I ran from North Campus all the way to South Hill. And it was, oh, wow. uh, it was glorious and yeah. surprisingly easy. And I say that because um, there's no way I could do that now. Anyway, right. um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I could do that. But uh, I remember being excited sophomore year, um, taking my first Shakespeare class. And yet, um, I think I still remember the lecturer's name. I know I still have at least one of the papers because I found it, you know, within the last uh, year. Um, as you know, we moved across the country from sclerotic New York to sunny Arizona. Um, so I've found one of these papers. Um, I can't tell you a single play we read during that um, class. I remember struggling with the writing. That's about it. Back up to high school. I think we read at least one play per year. And I remember one of them and the teacher who taught it. Uh, and I remember my friends, uh, Jason and Patrick, um, they basically would go about bandying these expressions from Shakespeare from that point, basically to now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I remember that. And Bill Polito taught it to us, uh, taught us Hamlet. 
Um, and it was very, very applicable uh, in our lives. The late Bill Polito, I believe. Um, so yeah, Shakespeare had a profound impact on my life, on my friends' lives. Um, but yes, it's definitely um, hard to grasp, I think, in, in you know the way the language was written. But here's what uh, Bill Polito said. He said, if Shakespeare were alive today, and of course he was saying this more than 25 years ago, but he said, if Shakespeare were alive today, he'd be writing for television. So let's contemporize it for this morning. Uh, if Shakespeare were alive today, he would be one of the star writers for Netflix or Amazon Prime or one of these 21st century iterations of a Hollywood studio, right? Yeah. Uh, and he would do a better job than Hallmark, that is for sure. That now, is now let's not let's let's not let's not <clears throat> let's not knock Hallmark or the Lifetime Channel. I mean, they've got they've got good Christmas movies. No, Lifetime. Yeah. But yeah. Lifetime is different. Lifetime and is I don't different. know if they've had, you know, a change in corporate ownership. But I remember switching from Hallmark uh, to Lifetime and seeing, oh, look, this is a plot that I can figure <laughs> out in 10 minutes because I haven't been exposed to it ad nauseum, you know. Now, well, I think there's a brilliance to what they can do mm -hmm. with that one plot. But, of course, one plot is one dimensional. Right. Um, and so some of their best movies which of course you know being a married man i'm gonna end up watching this christmas season right over and over and over um sorry um over and over and over um some of the um, best ones those mono plots allow the characterization to actually get fleshed out in a way where it gets your attention and you can get sucked in even though you know exactly what's going to happen <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> you know, it's interesting too because here, and then I'll uh, I'll seed the microphone. Oh, okay. Um, but it's interesting that here, one of the challenges for me reading Julius Caesar this time, which I did in preparation for this podcast, is knowing the historical outcomes better now than I did when I read this in high school. Um, it, it makes it harder to digest because you know what's going to happen. You know who is going to do what to whom. And so you can't really be sucked in by the drama. And yet for Shakespeare's audience, they also would have known what was going to happen and who was going to do what to whom. So uh, I guess that's part of the challenge for the playwright and the dramatist taking, you know, historical material and making it not just interesting, but relevant. And of course, as you found relevant for leadership and for leaders. So one of the things that we uh, want to do on this podcast is we want to acknowledge the power of language, like Dorolo just said, right? And so language uh speech um brings it brings uh brings ideas into existence and ideas once they are brought into existence bring movements into existence they bring inventions into existence words matter which is why free speech where we are free speech advocates on this podcast even mm -hmm. particularly for speech we do not like um because speech is important uh speech language brings reality uh to the world um, you talked about the words assassination and premeditation, both of which matter very much in Julius Caesar. But they also both they also both of those words set up real problems for leaders, right? They set up real issues for leaders uh, these days. And we're going to talk a little about the socio-political stuff around Julius Caesar because there's no way you can kind of avoid that. But these days we talk a lot about canceling or we talk about uh, social. Uh, assassination versus uh, physical uh, um, uh, assassination, right? Um, uh, not only assassination is a state tool or as a tool of social control, um, but assassination is a tool of revolution. Uh, again, mm -hmm. something that was that was talked about and visited in 100 Years of Solitude. And I would encourage you to go back and listen to our episode on the dark triad of leadership, Machiavellianism, corporate psychopathy, and narcissism, and how those all come together. And what you see in Shakespeare, what you see in the play, which we will again read directly from the play today. I'm going to read directly from the Old English. I'm going to read directly from the Folger um, Library Edition. Uh, we're going to try to flow on Shakespeare a little bit. I'm going to try to get a rhythm going there as I read from the book. 
but what you see in the language is Shakespeare planting seeds for all of these things, as Darola just said, that will come after, right? And setting up the culture. And that's that's genuine power. That's the power of, of good literature. That's the power of a, of a, of a playwright, to, to echo what Darola was saying. But it's also the power of vision. And so let's talk about that for just a moment. Back to Julius Caesar. So I'm going to frame this and contextualize this for people. So Cassius now is speaking to Brutus. Um, and he's kind of, well, he's kind of salting the dog a little bit here. So let's start off with Cassius. Then Brutus, I have much mistook your passion by means whereof this breast of mine hath buried thoughts of great value, worthy cogitations. Tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eyes see not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. Tis just, and it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye, that you might see your shadow, I have heard. Where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus, and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. And to what dangers would you lead me, Cassius, that you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me? So Cassius here and Brutus are kind of going back and forth um, after Caesar's been warned about the Ides of March, right? And <clears throat> if you're tracking, um, this is, again, from Act 1, Scene 2, right? And so if you're, if you're looking at this first act, right, these, these first initial scenes in Julius Caesar, Shakespeare is setting up the weight of language. He's setting up, um, he's setting up um, you know, uh, the, 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 the idea that people are going to be driven as Brutus claims, being, or not Brutus, I'm sorry, Cassius claims, as being driven by their passions, right? And Cassius here is starting to gild the lily. <laughs> He's starting to work Brutus over a little bit. And this is the brilliance of Shakespeare, right? Now, this play has five acts. Um, Cassius initially, and I'm going to say this later on, is not set up as being that much of an interesting dude. He doesn't really get to be too interesting until that third act and, and everything that happens in well, the, set, the back end of the second act and the, and the beginning of the third act. He doesn't really get to be an interesting character. He's just sort of this slithering, slithering, sliding uh, conception. And, and, and we use this here on the podcast a lot. We talk about this. He's a snake in the garden, but he's a <laughs> snake in Brutus's garden. And so... The, 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 the thing that we need to consider in this play written 500 years ago, almost now, is how many, how many snakes does a leader want to have in the garden, even if the leader's not in a leadership position? Thoughts on this? Because this is something that comes up again and again in literature, this idea that a leader has to watch out for the snakes, and sometimes they're not obvious. Sometimes snakes come in the form of chaos like the hyenas and the lion king but more often than not they come in the way that cassius is coming how do leaders Dorolo, how do leaders navigate that how do they how do they deal with that how do you deal with a cassius that's floating around in your organization very good question and so um the first thing uh i think that is necessary and it touches on you know, one of the foundational points of this podcast, as you know, is that leaders must not be blind to the fact that there are going to be snakes in the garden. Uh, that's really a recognition of human nature. In any organization, there are going to be leaders, there are going to be followers, and then there are going to be people who are just standing around. And then there are going to be the schemers, the meddlers, the busybodies. They're always going to be there. And so one of the advantages um, of having one's eyes open to the truth, as we have, being evangelicals, uh, is that we recognize that this is what human nature is. Now, isn't that a tragic view of human nature? Because, look, we are, it's 2021, soon to be 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, again, to contextualize this podcast, as you just did, um, you know, we've had 
uh, jury verdicts. We've had protests um, over the last couple of years. We've had COVID. But those are all just knock-on effects from the larger issue, which we take issue with on this podcast. We covered an unbearable lightness of being. This idea of the acidity of moral weakness, where we have nihilism. We are on the back end of 150 years of nihilism, existentialism, Derridian deconstructionism, and postmodernism. We have wound up in a clearing at the end of the path that all of those ideas get to you because ideas matter. Mm -hmm. And we're still here. And we're still here. We're, yeah, still we're still habits. here. But we're. <laughs> we're <laughs> but how do leaders? walk through all that because here's here's one of the interesting things that we we've noted and that we see right leadership very often is blind this is why we opened up with blindness very often is blind even to the impacts that those ideas those snakes have had in its own garden long before they ascended to a position or a title mm -hmm. how do leaders ex self-examine that so they're not pulled in like brutus is getting pulled in right now by cassius into something into a plot not of his own making by the way but mm -hmm. he's getting pulled in um how do leaders walk through the last 150 years and not get pulled in by the meddlers and the busybodies? Good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's possible for um, any leader not at some point or another to be taken in um, by the fumes that just happen to be in the air during his or her day. Uh, and there are certain things that help. I mean, the Bible helps. Uh, looking backwards to a time where there were different um, ideas being bandied about and then tracking what happened to those ideas can help. Um, it's one of the strengths of the classics and of the canon based on the classics is that there are certain fundamental truths that we in the West believe we have come across and that these were preserved in literature and thus literature is always going to be worth studying because it will always have a voice speaking to us about ourselves and about our events and so you know study has to be part of you know how a leader uh, fundamentally functions it's got to be a daily task a daily priority uh and it here in this context you know can help one see oh okay there are snakes in the garden okay well what types of snakes are they poisonous snakes or are they just slithering mm. okay because cassius was not just slithering <laughs> no that old boy was all up in there um uh -huh. <laughs> you know um so i have one of the taglines on the or the tagline for this podcast is because reading and reading and understanding literature is better than trying to read and understand another, yet another business book mm -hmm. that's the tagline for this podcast and it really encapsulates this idea of us defaulting so much in business literature to philosophy or psychology Mm -hmm. which is as a result of these Nietzschean slash Freudian intersections and even some Jungian intersections in there around consciousness and around, you know, talk therapy and some other ideas. Okay. And I know I'm mixing a bunch of ideas together there. Folks, you can email me and tell me that I'm mixing a bunch of ideas together there. It's fine. Uh, the larger point is this. I worry that, and this is why we started this podcast, I worry that leaders aren't reading literature. Or if they mm -hmm. are reading it, they're not applying the lessons because they're merely looking at it as entertainment. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Netflix, merely looking at it as another streaming show, right? Uh, you know, Merchant of Venice starring Al Pacino. Hey, I'm going to go spend two hours looking at Merchant of Venice and then I'm going to get out. It doesn't matter because I'm just going to go back to my real life. We kind of have this idea that psychology is somehow more solid than literature for a leader. And mm -hmm. that's, I don't find that to be the truth. Oh, um, I think it's far less valuable than literature. Um, it doesn't surprise me. Um, it's because of its its patent of science that, in my opinion, today, it has the weight that it has. Um, even when it when it when it was first coming out, at least Freudian psychology, when it was first coming out, you know, about eighty years ago, um, I think I have a little bit more of an understanding of why it had some weight then. But you know, post that to now, um, some of it has stayed. Some of it actually functions and is helpful, but. I think that they will keep running into the wall that was actually voiced by an actual Roman named Pontius Pilatus, right? Pontius Pilate. What is and what truth? is truth? <laughs> A truly great line, by the way, um, in the in the in the uh, at the trial of uh, 
well, a trial of the man Jesus, right? Um, what is truth? What does that mean? A truly excellent line and something that not only have leaders struggled with throughout, well, all time, um, but really encapsulated in this idea that the West has struggled with, which is, again, a larger kind of macrocosm that this podcast sits in, uh, which is about how do we, and this is why we started off with Book of Nehemiah, how do we go back to the core things? How do we go back to the old things so that we're not fooled by things that appear to be new, uh, new wine and old wineskins? Mm -hmm. Once again, how do we not be fooled by the taste of that new wine? Um, because sometimes it's not new, sometimes that wine is poison. Mm -hmm. Or the other way around. It's the same old wine that was kicked 20 years ago and is right. more vinegary now. And if you put it in a new vessel, it's still vinegar. Still vinegar. Back to, back to the Shakespeare. Mm. So Cassius is still working Brutus over. So we start with Cassius again, act one, scene two. I know that virtue to be in you, Brutus, as well as I do know your outward favor. Well, honor is the subject of my story. I cannot tell what you and other men think of this life, but for my single self, I had his life not be as live to be in awe of such a thing as I myself. I was born free as Caesar. So were you. We have both fed as well, and we can both endure the winter's cold, as well as he. For once, upon a raw and gusty day, the troubled Tiber, chafing with her shores, Caesar said to me, Dearest thou, Cassius, now leap in with me into this angry flood and swim to yonder point. Upon the word, accounted as I was, I plunged in and bade him follow, so indeed he did. The torrent roared, and we did buffet it with lusty sinews, throwing it aside and stemming it with hearts of controversy. But ere we could arrive, the point proposed, Caesar cried, Cassius, help me, or I sink. I, as Aeneas, our great ancestor, did from the flames of Troy upon his shoulder the old Achesis bear, so from the waves of Tiber did I the tired Caesar. And this man is now become a god? And Cassius is a wretched creature and must bend his body of Caesar carelessly but nod to him? He had fewer, he had fever when he was in Spain, and when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. Tis true, this god did shake. His coward lips did from their color fly, and that same eye whose bend doth all the world did lose his luster. I did hear him groan. Ay, and that tongue of his that bade the Romans mark him and write his speeches in their books. Alas, it cried, give me some drink to Titus. As a sick girl, you gods, it doth amaze me. A man of such a feeble temper should so get the start of the majestic world and bear the palm alone. Another general shout. I do believe that these applauses are for some new honors that are heaped upon Caesar. Why, man, he doth bestride the narrow world like a colossus, and we petty men walk under his huge legs and peep about to find ourselves dishonorable graves. Men at some times are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in the stars, uh, but in ourselves that we are underlings. There are pieces of this that are left off. I loved reading this. There are pieces of this that are left off. Cassius's entire speech for me is about the leadership issue of feet of clay from politics in a geopolitical context. Let's put this in a geopolitical context. Um, we now live in the backwash to use this term, the backwaters, <laughs> not of the Tiber, but of culture. <laughs> even the cultural Tiber, we live in the backwaters of a cultural Tiber of 50 plus years of never trust anybody over 30. Mm. We mm. fundamentally um, defy, dismiss, 
and in general ignore authority if we can get away with it ignore authority as much as we possibly can and this cultural erosion of a respect for authority was not nearly as present when shakespeare was writing julius caesar there they had a different conception they had the conception of the divine right of kings right they had the conception that there were certain men who were born to rule Calpurnia is going to say this later on. There are certain men that were born to rule, and other people are just born to die. Uh, the Greeks sort of got this a little bit earlier, even than that. Uh, the, the strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. <laughs> and we in the West have rejected all that, but we've taken the pendulum and we've swung it all the way to the other end, where we say no one has any authority, and every man for himself, and devil take the hindmost. Okay. In this section, Cassius is... Um, and very cleverly Shakespeare does this, Cassius is showing how dangerous narcissism can be. But he doesn't have that mm. word, you know, because, mm. again, this is this is like a thousand years before Freud. He doesn't have that word, right? He doesn't have the word narcissism, but he has an understanding of the psychology of the temperament of a gentleman who, A, does not want to bend his knee to authority. B, is highly narcissistic. I mean, we see this in the entire example of of uh, talking about Caesar and the Tiber and then Caesar's epileptic fit, which which we believe fundamentally now from historical evidence that, that Julius Caesar had some form of epilepsy, um, as did most of the folks in the Caesar-Augustian uh, genetic line <laughs> that ruled Rome from the time of the death of Julius Caesar, gosh, almost all the way to the middle part of the empire, um, and then even in many cases was still influential to the fall of Rome, mm. historically speaking. So we do believe that Caesar had some form of epilepsy. So Cassius is taking these physical things and he's saying, Caesar is not a god. Caesar's got feet of clay. Caesar's mm -hmm. just a dude. And how dare I have to bend the knee to his authority? How mm. dare I have to trust him? Mm -hmm. Leaders are dealing with this now. <laughs> what do you do when you're a small or medium-sized business owner or you're a manager and someone's like, screw you. I saw you last night getting drunk. Mm -hmm. Forget you. I'm not going to follow you. Or like we're going through this 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 moment right now in organizational culture called the great resignation. We have mm. more people resigning from jobs than we do have people accepting them. Leaders mm. forget tapes, figuring out how to lead a team. Leaders are trying to figure out how to even create one <laughs> yes. because now yes. we've got Absolutely. Cassius's everywhere, right? Mm. Everyone sees that everybody else has feet of clay, which means there's no forgiveness in the arena, which by the way, I haven't talked about Christianity other than obliquely in terms of the Bible or Jesus, but Christianity also layered all that out because the tragic view of humanity says that if man is fallen, they need a savior in order mm -hmm. to compensate for the feet of clay because every man will disappoint. Okay. Let's not make this theological. Let's not make this biblical. Let's make this practical. What do leaders do? What do leaders take from Cassius's speech here um, about showing their feet of clay? Hmm. Well, you might wish to, but not to a Cassius. A Cassius, you would do better just chucking him off of a cliff. Um, the issue, one of the issues, I don't really want to say I have because it's from critics other than myself, um, but Cassius and some of the other characters in this play aren't actually characters. They're just types. Mm -hmm. So Cassius is a type who is reflexively self-oriented. You can frame anything Cassius says with the following words, not blank than I. Mm. Sorry, not more blank than I. Caesar is not more whatever it is than I. He is not more than I. Brutus, in contrast, there is no than I. And his political fault was that it was his personal honor. It was not, for example, the honor of Rome, really, because Rome wasn't offended. You look at the behavior of the mob. Mm -hmm. They weren't offended. They were... Um, they're obviously funny, but in the beginning, <laughs> yeah, the mob is great in like right, the fourth yeah. act. They're they're fabulous. They've got they've got uh, they've got they're going back and forth. They're urging on one moment. They're urging, you know, hey, yeah, we're 
well, I don't want to give away the ending, but like it's an old book. So, okay. Hey, yeah, we're in favor of this thing happening. And then they immediately moved to the other side of, hey, is Mark Anthony going to pay us? Or not even Mark Anthony going to pay us, I'm sorry. Is, what, what did Caesar leave in his will to what did Mark Anthony, what's he going to pay us to be on his side? Like they're all over the place, which, by the way, is a commentary about democracy, a subtle dig at democracy and the idea of, which we'll talk about a little bit later on here um, as well, but this idea of the, uh, the the flagrate the, the inflagration of mob rule, which again the ancients really believed, and and it's interesting how we're kind of arcing back towards this idea at a geopolitical level, this idea that democracy, and, and we've been saying this for like hundred years now, we are a democracy, we're a democracy, we're a democracy, we're not a democracy, we're a republic, folks. America mm. is a republic. Mm not a democracy for exactly the kinds of reasons you were just saying about the mob or that I was mm. saying about the mob. But yes, the mob is fascinating and funny. They're hugely mm -hmm. amusing. Mm -hmm. And started off being in love with Caesar. Right. And so they're all on board. Right. And thus Brutus's um, offense, what offended him, big word nowadays, what offended him, uh, offended him and not mm -hmm. Rome. Rome meaning the mob in the street, as well as the Senate. They were on board with what was happening. Um, and Brutus was not, but that was mm -hmm. about Brutus, you know? And of course, um, in, in my view, his essential blindness was that he couldn't see that. This is not about either Rome's honor or Rome's good. It's about my honor. However, I lack the ambition to then take my honor, infuse it with what is for Rome's good. Because if he had, this play would have ended very different. That idea of essential blindness, you know, kind of flesh that out a little bit more for leaders. How do leaders avoid being essentially blind? It's deep, right? Um, but one of... That's I what we mean, do on this podcast. We get deep. Indeed. <laughs> uh, and yet... Um, one of the advantages for how truth is structured is that truth can be approached um, as a child would approach something. That's the, one of the fundamental ironies about truth. Um, kids will often get it better than adults will. Um, and not just because they haven't been dressed up, but they haven't been twisted up yet in a way with human nature that makes it harder for them to see certain truths. Obviously, there'll be truths over their head because they're not mature enough to handle them. But... Arguably, there are not very many, <laughs> or at least that's what this f husband and father would say. But anyway, um, so first, the question, the simple, direct question, okay, so w why are you here? Mm. What are you trying to accomplish? So to the play, Brutus, what are you trying to accomplish? Oh, I'm removing the tyrant. Okay, who's going to take his place? What? We don't need someone to take his place. Okay, so who then will hold the reins of the state? That is one of the essential political questions that he failed to address. He the, failed to plan for because he failed to see it. That's one of the things that we talk about in our consultancy with, with folks all of the time particularly mid-level leaders. Um, we had a question the other day from a client and their query was that, or was this was the context of their query. They said, you know, we've got supervisors who are basically terrible. They take all the credit. They give out all the blame. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really like them. Hey, son, what do we do about this? And I said, well, you can stage a mutiny. <laughs> you can stage an assassination. You can stage a professional assassination. Mm -hmm. But you better make sure you have all your ducks in a row. You better make sure that not only have you gotten the people on board, which that one seems obvious to most folks, get the people on board that are going to be on board with you. But then you better have a replacement idea because when that person's supervisor who you're going to politically, who you're going to uh, professionally assassinate, that person's boss comes to you and says, congratulations, there's a vacuum. Now you have to have a plan to fill that vacuum. Mm -hmm. And in the later part of the fourth act of Julius Caesar and the beginning of the fifth act, uh, Brutus and Cassius kind of fall out. They kind of, and we're not going to cover that today on the podcast. It's a great play. Go read it. Um, go get it. Go watch a film about it. Go listen to an audiobook production, actually, of it. Go listen to a full throated British Shakespearean audiobook production. That's my, my pitch for that because they're going to be, you're going to get, you're going to get all the flavor of Shakespeare there. But, um, 
But Cassius and Brutus are in this uh, camp. And now this is where, again, Shakespeare's brilliance really comes in because he's taking uh, myth and now flipping it back into history and turning it back into this is what historically happened um, at the end of a uh, of, of Julius at the end of Julius Caesar's assassination. But this is also what historically happens in general. You're talking about archetypes in general. This is what happens when you assassinate the state leader. This is what happens when you engage in an organizational assassination. This is what happens when you remove the head of a household for, for whatever means. This is what happens. There's nature abhors the vacuum. Einstein mm -hmm. told us that. <laughs> and so we told these folks, you have to have a plan to fill that vacuum. And much like Cassius and Brutus, when we mentioned that you might want to have an idea for how to fill that vacuum, all of a sudden the question is just stopped. Mm -hmm. Because everybody gets so excited fundamentally, and this is a fundamental, I think, of these kinds of ideas. Everybody gets so excited about the act of doing the act of taking out the leader, the mutinous act, the assassination act. Everybody gets so excited about that. Mm -hmm. But they're not as excited about all of the structural things that have to happen afterward to support the organization because it's not going anywhere. It's just going to mm -hmm. be empty. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the capacity to fill it, that makes you essentially blind. Mm. 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 It makes me think of... I'm certain Machiavelli, but it also may be in uh, Sun Tzu Ping Bao, right? The Art mm -hmm. of War. Mm -hmm. um, the advantage of being able to take a state whole mm -hmm. rather than to have to rebuild a mm -hmm. state that you have essentially destroyed yep. or literally destroyed. Yep. Machiavelli um, argues that in, I, I believe it's the middle part of the first book or the middle part of the second book when he's talking about statecraft. Mm -hmm. um, again, we covered this on the podcast, uh, episode number four, five with Erica Weed. Uh, go back and listen to that. But we, we covered that. Yeah. Like when you take out that person, mm -hmm. nature of horse vacuum. So take the state whole. Take the team whole. Take the organization whole. Oh, well, that's too big. I can't do that. I'm only a mid-level leader. Then you're not ready to engage in a professional assassination. Mm -hmm. You're just not ready to engage in it. Mm -hmm. And yet that person's problem will still remain. Oh, and the person. Where's right. this glory hound doing nothing? Right, so exactly. What am I going to do? <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Which is why we recommend that you use our products and services here at HSCT, HSCT Publishing like leadership toolbox um and uh and uh, like uh like uh, reading our books like the 12 rules for leader leaders which is coming out in april uh and of course taking advantage of our leading keys product because these will help you stay on the path uh, so you don't have to destroy the entire organization but if you're going to do it we will give you the tools to be able to think about that critically mm. back to the book back to the play so now caesar Scene shifts. Caesar's walking, or it might be that he's riding. It's not very clear. But Caesar's moving. Caesar's on the move, right? Potentially going back to his house, his villa in Italy. Uh, going to go lay down with Calpurnia, his wife. And uh, he's talking a little bit to Anthony, and he makes an interesting observation here. Again, uh, Act 1, Scene 2 of Julius Caesar. Let me, and this is Caesar, Caesar begins, let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep a nights. Yon Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. Yep, by the way. Yep. Such men are dangerous, the ones who think too much. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy who thinks too much. I'm accused of overthinking. Uh, I just started rolling in jujitsu. And uh, one of the big pieces of feedback that uh, the instructor had for me is, you got to think less and do more. Like, yeah, shut up, go away. <laughs> but he's not wrong. He's not incorrect, right? Think less, do more. Uh, Anthony says, fear him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. He's a noble Roman and well given. Nope. Bad situational awareness there, Anthony. Mark Anthony should have been smarter, which we'll get to this in just a second. Mark mm. Anthony should have been smarter as Caesar's number two. And actually, this is the time of the triumvirate to historically contextualize this. And so uh, Mark Anthony was always the weakest of the triumvirate. And 
uh, Shakespeare shows this weakness. Um, and it's not moral weakness that Anthony has. It's ambition that Anthony has. But he wants to hide his ambition. Um, he wants to uh, couch his ambition in glorious, honor-driven, virtue-driven terms. Mm. And, of course, if he can ride on Caesar's coattails... He's gonna hitch his he's gonna hitch his star <laughs> or hitch his horses to that rising star. Fear mm. him not, Caesar. He's not dangerous. Don't worry about it. don't worry about Cassius. Don't worry about that lean and hungry look. He's noble. That's a look of nobility. Um, and he's well given. I love that term, well given. Caesar responds, Would he were fatter? Now that's interesting in our day when we really value losing weight. <laughs> would he would he were fatter but i fear him not ah and now caesar goes to this core thing and i want to talk about fear here in just a minute but i fear him not yet if my name were liable to fear i do not know the man i should avoid so soon as that spare cassius he reads much just like we do on this podcast he is a great observer just like we are on this podcast and he looks quite through the deeds of men just like we do on this podcast he loves no plays, as thou dost, Anthony. He hears no music. He's not falling for entertainment. That's what Caesar's saying here. Seldom he smiles, and smiles in such a sort as if he mocked himself and scorned his spirit. I could be moved to smile at anything. Such men as he will never be at heart's ease, whiles they behold a greater than themselves, and therefore... Are they very dangerous? I rather tell thee what is to be feared than what I fear. For always I am Caesar. I love that last piece right there. For always I am Caesar. I'm obsessed with this idea. Um, and I've been obsessed with this idea for a few years, but Julius Caesar really brought it to the fore. And thinking about Shakespeare really brought it to the fore for me. Throughout this play, Caesar never puts it down. He never puts down the palm. He never puts down the glory of Rome. He never puts down the glory of himself. Even when he's with his wife, he's still Caesar. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have the idea that leaders are, have feet of clay, and not only have we gone over in the opposite extreme of questioning every leader, but we have this other dynamic that's dark and underneath it, which is we want our leaders to always be virtuous and perfect. Mm. Um, we saw this with, um, well, you know, we saw this. I, okay, this is a perfect example for my life. My mom, and DeRolo knows my mother, uh, my mother uh, said to me uh, many, many years ago in the 90s, uh, when I was kind of really excited about Michael Jordan, right? She said, you know, America likes its heroes humble. And Michael Jordan, to tie this into him, said even Republicans buy sneakers. So he was never political uh -huh. uh, during his career. Now, after word, that's a different story. But during his basketball career, he never pontificated on politics as maybe a LeBron James, I'm looking at you, would do. But there's an argument to be made that our culture has shifted. Mm -hmm. And that there's and there's also an argument to be made that with this idea of social media and and the fact, not just the idea, the fact of social media platforms and the desire for authenticity, and I've mm. heard this a couple of times over the last few uh, months now, everybody's got to be authentic. Everybody's doing better when they're more authentic. Okay, but like, how much authenticity do you really want from me? No, no, no. Mm. You don't want authenticity for me. You want curated authenticity for me because Correct. as a Absolutely. leader, right, as a leader, you want me to always be Caesar. You actually don't want me to be transparent. You really don't want that because if I get transparent, if I get really real here, I may mm. say some things that you may not like. I may say some things that may uh, have you uh, cancel me or have you stop following me. I may say some things that may have me lose my job. Mm-hmm. How are leaders to balance these two tensions? Or is there a, or, or do you just live with the tension? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's weird because one, it's a fundamental choice leaders have to make. Two, um, I'm wondering how much we struggle with 
the consequences of the choice rather than the choice. Because um, if you choose always to be Caesar, you're going to get stabbed in the back, even by your lover's son, because that's who Brutus was. Mm -hmm. Caesar's famous mistress, I believe it was um, Servilla or Servilia. Um, she was Brutus's mom. So he knew Brutus. Mm -hmm. And so, and knew Brutus in a way he didn't know the other assassins. And so, that famous misquoted line because caesar was a very well educated man and thus would have said it in greek which was the cultural language of the roman elite kai su technon and you child right mm -hmm. and so if you make that choice to always be caesar you get stabbed in the back even by your friends let's say son um or you can equivocate, you can bend with the wind, even if you're trying to hoist a sail to carry the ship somewhere else, dash Marcus Antonius, dash, um, and where where does he end up, right? You know, he ends up, he ends he, up in a camp <laughs> fighting, or fighting a war he didn't plan for. <laughs> right, but um, in the, at least in this play... Or on the bed of Cleopatra well. if you're Richard yes. Burton. <laughs> in this play, he, he makes out pretty well. It's just... Right. Um, in the subsequent play, perhaps, and certainly in history, we find out, right. oh, okay. Um, he failed to take his measure, as you pointed out, of Cassius. That was not fatal. Fatal was failing to take his measure of Octavius. Um, he would have been better served by having a maniacal passion that hated all Caesars, including the one who in this play he called Caesar after Julius' death and just killed them all than failing to take measure of uh, the actual Augustus, right? Mm -hmm. The one who mastered the scene and fundamentally changed the nature of things, fundamentally took control of events and set in stage uh, basically uh, a chain of actions, a chain of behavior that lasted for centuries. So... Did yeah. Mark Anthony have a failure in first principles, though? By failing to to take measure, appropriate measure of Cassius, he just he just repeated his failure with Octavius. Right, but the consequences were so much greater. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. and so, but I think you're correct. It's the same failure. It's, yeah. it's his inability to size up a man. You know? Right. There you go. Um, and say well, this I... this man is a threat. Well, Stay away his, from him. His inability to size up a man, and then you've got Caesar's hubris, which is in essence what you're really talking about, about not being able to put down being Caesar. Mm -hmm. So you've got hubris, you've got inability to take measure of a man, then you've got Cassius's snake-like tendencies, and you've got Brutus's ability to be manipulated. No one here has virtue, and yet they are all speaking in virtuous language. Mm -hmm. And this is the dichotomy of leadership as a famous book title goes this is the dichotomy of leadership this is the this is the two in one right of being a leader you will have these weaknesses you will have these blindnesses you will sometimes not stay on the path mm -hmm. but the the ones who succeed are going to be the ones the leaders who succeed are going to be the ones who recognize it as quickly as possible and correct it and get back on the path and shakespeare Shakespeare shows fully, I, I believe what you just said, fully the consequences of that choice. Mm. Um, and you talked about The Art of War, which is a book we will be covering uh, in the podcast in, 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 a, in some upcoming episodes, um, along with uh, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee and um, Miyoto Musashi's The Book of Five Rings. We're going to do a whole thing on, on all of those. and We're going to talk about jiu-jitsu and the martial arts and martial thinking. Mm -hmm. These were martial cultures. So mm -hmm. even though the Roman elite was spoken Greek, they were still martial people. They mm -hmm. still believed in, at least at this point in time in, in Roman history, they still believed in the greatness of the Republic, the greatness of Rome. Mm -hmm. They still had cultural confidence. Mm. That's a follow, really good expression. Well, and a follow-up question to this is, one of the problems that I see in America, and I'm not the first person to note this, is that we seem to have a lack of cultural confidence. 
I believe that fundamentally that comes from leaders leading in small businesses because, as I say to clients, as we say to clients, um, and to contextualize it to Julius Caesar, you're going to, you're, you're, the people who work with you are going to have more direct, are going to be more directly impacted by what you do than what the President of the United States does or Caesar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're their first point of leadership, not mm-hmm. the President of the United States, not the local congressman, not even the mayor. You're the first point of leadership. Mm-hmm. How do leaders have cultural confidence? And I think I think small and medium-sized business leaders do, but how do you maintain it when it's becoming eroded uh, all the way down to, I think, the core um, of America? And maybe I'm being you know, dramatic here to make a point. Uh, maybe everything's fine where you were at, listener, but where I'm at, the window I'm looking out of, I'm seeing that erosion. How do leaders fight that on a day-to-day basis? Actually, have an answer. I'm slightly surprised. A full disclosure that I actually have an answer to that, not knowing what's coming. Um, and well, it's... that's what we do on this podcast, folks. <laughs> we <laughs> set the guest up, twist. and we uh, and we uh, yeah. we see if they can punt. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to run with this one. I think it it requires three things, and it's the last one that is the real rub, and that is um, counterintuitive. So these leaders have to know the culture, okay? They have to love the culture. Here it comes. They have to change the culture. Mm -hmm. And so there are those who know it and love it and refuse to change it, and they're not leading anything. There are those who do not know it and claim they love it, but how can you love that which you do not know? Um, Do you buy for your wife flowers she hates? Okay, do you forget your children's birthdays? Okay. Um, we don't believe you love them because you can't be bothered to know them. And so um, it's tricky. Also, knowing the culture and hating it and then wanting to change it. Okay, that kind of nihilism culturally um, uh, is dangerous. And this day, we deal with a lot of that. Um, This notion that, uh, taking it back to the play, that there is no greatness in Rome, that Rome Mm -hmm. is the devil, and the sooner destroyed, the better. And those people don't see the barbarians at the gate, just waiting to get in and do whatever they wish. Um, And so they make the worst sort of traitors. Mm. Mm. Brutus at least had an idea. He had an idea about something worthy. My fault with Brutus um, is failing to see the political consequences and to take measures so that once he got control of the state, he led the state in a better direction. Um, That's something that um, I don't know if Cicero tried. I haven't researched it in preparation for this podcast, the Ciceronian angle. Uh, Of course, a far better lawyer than me, Cicero. Um, Cicero, who became one of the triumvirs after Mm -hmm. um, Caesar's death, but uh, Cicero, who ultimately was proscribed and killed. Right. And so perhaps he didn't take the right measures (laughs) in terms of the changes (laughs) that he didn't help initiate, but... Uh, with his, you know, amazing ability to seize what is there and then, you know, go somewhere with it. Um, it's just perhaps he just failed to recognize how nasty Marcus Antonius might be willing to be, or perhaps not taking his measure of Octavius, of Caius Octavius, also known as Caesar, also known as Augustus. Um, so, yeah. It's uh, so I, I think it's those three things. You can know the culture, love the culture, and then you have to change the culture. Um, and in so doing, I think you can, with a clear conscience for those who care about conscience, um, and with integrity for those who care about integrity, actually communicate what is good about our culture, and then make, as it were, converts. You know, um, that requires leaders to be evangelical about leadership 
and it requires right. well, and not only leadership, but it requires leaders to be evangelical about the organizations in which they work. Because we're we're also a practical podcast here, right? And we've been talking very philosophically um, about literature here and, and contextualizing that in the, into the philosophy of leadership. But everything that we have talked about today at a tactical level requires leaders to love the thing that they are in, to tell a love story. Uh, one of the things that we do with clients is we, uh, we talk about in storytelling. Uh, we, talk, we just did this with a client recently. We talk about what are the five stories that every leader hears Mm -hmm. in order to persuade other leaders. And so on this podcast, we are developing a quest story. This is a long form podcast, you know, hour and a half, two hour, two hour plus long conversations about literature where you're not going to get everything in the first five minutes. You're not going to get everything in the last five minutes. You're going to have to commit to the structure. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because we wanted to do something where people committed and some people will commit. Some people will not. That's okay. Okay, but such a commitment requires you understanding that the story that we are telling is both a quest story, which I already mentioned, and a love story. We're in love with literature, and leaders have to hear these five stories. And by the way, all five stories are the ones that Shakespeare wrote about. So we have a love story, we have a quest story, we have a stranger in a strange land story, <laughs> we have a rags to riches story, or a riches to rags story, and then of course, uh, my personal favorite, a revenge story. Now, sometimes those stories are all mixed together and sometimes they're teased apart, but in organizations, leaders have to tell a love story and a quest story together in order to change the culture. In order to do those three things that Rolo was just talking about, leaders have to tell a quest story and a love story, not only to their followers, but also to themselves in order to become evangelical about changing the culture. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Brutus, back to the play, act two, scene one. We're going to kind of skip forward a little bit, go to Act 2, Scene 1. Brutus begins. He's sitting in his uh, office, such as it were. And, and the way I conceptualize this in my head, the way I contextualize this in my head, and maybe this will help all of you who are listening, he's a man sitting at a desk convincing himself that this is something he needs to do, a path mm -hmm. that he needs to be on, uh, the long, dark night of the soul, such as it were. Brutus speaks, it must be by his death. He's talking about Caesar here. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. Exactly what Dirola was just saying. Nothing personal, just the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. How would power change Caesar's nature? It is the bright day that brings forth the adder. The snake, such as it were, and that craves wary walking. Crown him that, and then I grant we put a sting in him, that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. That, by the way, pause, that, by the way, is a line that every leader should have uh, tattooed on their like heart or on a, on a cool looking curly Q, uh, text plaque in their office. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affection swayed more than his reason. I don't know if this guy, I don't know. I don't know. But it's a common proof that lowliness is young man's ambition is young ambitions ladder. Where to the climber upward turns his face, but when once he attains the upmost round, he then unto the ladder turns his back. Basically what he's saying is people climb the ladder and then they pull it up. By the way, we see this in our culture everywhere. Looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. He spits on the people behind him. So Caesar may, then lest he may prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is fashioned thus, that what he has augmented would run to these and these extremities, and therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would, as his kind grow mischievous, and kill him in the shell. Kill him in the shell. Mm -hmm. Brutus admits here he has no axe to grind. <laughs> he says, I have no axe to grind here. I am doing what I am doing for the state. 
I'm doing it for other people, and even more so, even at a deeper level, I'm doing it because in general, when men climb the ladder, they get to be ambitious, and then they they destroy everything. So I'm I'm doing everybody a favor here. I am doing what none of you are strong enough to do. I'm making the decision. By the way, pushed into it by Cassius, but let's leave that aside for just a minute. I I and by the way, I can't acknowledge the sting that has been put in me. So okay, I am doing what none of you have the will to do. I saw this in a movie once. Um, and somebody was like, somebody went, oh, it was Fight Club. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. When uh, Brad Pitt, great movie, by the way, from 1999. Uh, and most guys my age know that movie because that was one of the seminal films that we watched in our in our era, um, along with The Matrix and Office Space. That's the triumvirate. Uh, <laughs> it's a weird triumvirate, but that's the triumvirate, right? Uh-huh. And uh, Brad Pitt, when he shows up in the middle of the uh, third act after the reveal that he really is, the other actor, I can't remember the actor's name right now, but that he really is that other guy. And he says, Is it Ed Norton? Ed Norton. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yes. Brilliant, brilliant actor. That's brilliant why I actor. didn't want to let it go. I didn't want his names not to go mentioned. So Ed Norton. So Ed Norton's there, and Ed Norton is totally blown away that Brad Pitt was living inside of him. And now he can see the thing, he can see his passions. And his passions are, of course, tattooed with a shaved head and a big old fur coat. This is a shout out to Colby Sutter, a uh, previous uh, books of Book of Nehemiah podcast, podcast co-host there. Uh, but big old fur coat, right? And he says to Brad, the Brad Pitt character, basically says to Ed Norton, and it's the same character. He says, once again, and I'm going to paraphrase this here because I don't remember the exact line, but it, re- it reminds me of what Brutus says. Or the, the it surmises, surmises what Brutus is, is saying here. Once again, uh, I am going to help you out. And I will lead you kicking and screaming into what you really want to do. And at the end of it all, you will thank me. Or, mm-hmm. or, as Jack Nicholson says in A Few Good Men at the end of his brilliant Man on Walls speech yep. to Tom Cruise, who's going to protect this world? You? You, Lieutenant Caffey? You know, you look at me and you spit on the name of the Marines. Instead, I would rather, if you're not going to stand a post or hold a gun, I would rather you just thank me. And be on your way. Mm -hmm. This is an unexplored idea. This idea that there are put upon leaders in the world who are doing hard things with no thank yous or who are about to take on a hard task without a thank you. And the thing they really want is acknowledgement, which is, by the way, another form of just rubbing their hubris like Caesar's. And because they don't get that, they have resentment. So the question I have, I guess, why was Brutus so resentful? What, what, in, what need did he have to be resentful? He could have just floated along. He could have hung out. Yeah, Cassius was talking to him, but eh, he didn't have to descend into criminality and making moral and ethical choices that didn't represent their high, his highest ideals. You know, and by the way, he could have voted Caesar out. It was still a republic. Now there was a danger that Caesar would go on the other side, but these types of extreme responses put the body politic in danger. Whether it's a small business, whether it's a medium-sized business, or whether it's a geopolitical entity, mm. why was Brutus driven by resentment? Um, in the play. I think it's because, uh, and it's what makes him tragic, right? And actually a character, but tragic. Um, His tragic flaw is his own notion of his own honor. And as Uh, a noble Roman, there cannot be a king. His own ancestor was involved in ensuring that. Mm -hmm. Uh, His own ancestor with, I believe, his own, the same names, was was involved in assuring that there would be henceforth no kings in Rome. And so here is one, and I believe the history was actually a little bit past that. I don't think they could have voted him out. I think the Senate actually voted him dictator for life. Uh, they so did, but that was, that was it. so the way the play is set up, it's before they vote him dictator for life. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, 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 uh, the, the, pre- the preemptory event, I can't think, that's not the right term, but the event that occurs that leads into the actual knife in Caesar is um, 
this fellow Simber coming and, you know, basically asking, hey, can I get a little consideration here? And Caesar is now distracted having this conversation and they kind of jump on him. So <laughs> Shakespeare kind of skips over that part a little <laughs> bit or doesn't include it. And I don't know if they didn't have any historical context for that that we got later on in subsequent subsequent years. Um, or it was just of, his his work or, as a dramatist. Right, right exactly. Yeah. Um, giving people more of a choice rather than here's the fait accompli, Caesar, Caesar is there. Mm. And now we're all stuck with him. He is the first man in Rome, something that uh, I believe he himself said was all that he wanted. And he would rather be top dog in a mud puddle than second swimmer in the sea, as it were, the, the, the Tiber, the Tiberian mm. Sea, right? But right. anyway, um, so as tragedy brutus's flaw is he cannot get over his own sense of honor as a noble roman we do not have a king here's this man what they tried to make him king what he refused the crown uh oh well he and then of course what he attributes to caesar um and i, I apologize i can't quote the text but what he attributes to caesar of course is not apparently what caesar's motives actually were right it's, uh, nor it, yeah, does he look at who was handing him the crown, no. namely Marcus Antonius, <laughs> thrice. And so, you know. Uh, right, that's but, that's in the very first yeah. act when the people, uh, basically Cassius comes by, or not Cassius, Casca comes by, and then Casca's a great character, by the way. We have not talked about Casca at all, but Casca, who eventually wound up being one of the conspirators, in the very first act, comes by and tells Cassius and Brutus exactly what the uh, what the number of times were that Caesar refused the crown, and Casca's kind of cynical. Retweeting. He's, he, re he's retweeting, retweeting the whole he's thing. Retweeting the whole thing. <laughs> he's the whole that thing. guy. Right. And, and later on, he shows up later on when the conspirators are going on and on, and then he shows up another time. I believe it's in Act 4, but he shows up another time. And in essence, he's retweeting again. He's literally, Casca is literally the, he's literally the Jack Dorsey of Julius Caesar. <laughs> um, and, and just like a retweeter, or just like a tweeter, he's annoying. Like, he's, he's, he's ridiculous. Um, but he also wants to go along with, with the crowd, and he wants to be on the side of, and this is a popular term these days, he wants to be on the quote-unquote right side of history. Whatever the mm. hell that means, mm. um, and so ask Fukuyama. <laughs> there, there you go. Right, go ask him. Go ask him, um, or Samuel Huntington. Although Huntington was a little bit closer on this than Fukuyama, but anyway, um, and so you've got these characters who their motives are cloudy, um, and I want to go back to this idea of being a top dog in a mud puddle. But the, you, you've got these 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 leaders, not leaders, these characters, these men such as it were, and by the way, all you women who are listening to the podcast, there are females in this play, um, but they are second fiddle, right? Um, they are not the primary drivers. You've got Portia, who is Brutus's wife, um, and you've got Calpurnia, who basically warns Caesar not to go to the Senate, and he does anyway, because, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute, because the augurs and the soothsayers basically, he says the gods can't make up their minds, so I'm going to act, which again is another form of hubris. Um, That's a bad... Cute. That's a really bad form of hubris. <laughs> oh, Always really being Caesar pales in comparison to oh, heavenly being said this. Oh, I can I, I know what I'm doing. Right. That, right. That's a very humanist flaw, right there. It, it is. It yeah. is. And it just shows that these these again these concepts are not new. Mm -hmm. Humanity has been struggling with these things for years, and literature brings us a way to talk about them and think about them. Mm -hmm. By the way, this idea of being a top dog in a mud puddle, um, wrote this down. It's probably going to show up in a Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, Shorts. By the way, if you're not listening to Shorts, you should be. Uh, they are two to four minute rants, raves, ideas, thoughts, stories um, that I have about leadership. And there's no co-host on Shorts. It's just me talking for two to four minutes. You may want to check those out. We've got like seven of them out right now, soon to be ten. Anyway, uh, dropped on alternate weeks from this main podcast. Anyway, so... There's this idea, and I'm going to explore it a little bit, like I said, in the shorts, but there's this idea that, and we take it from Milton much later, um, well, about 200 years later than Shakespeare, roughly, two to 300 years later, two to 250, that's closer to it, two to 50 later than, than Shakespeare, I think, and Dorola will correct me in just a second here. But anyway, we take this idea from Milton, you know, that, that, and, and Milton puts these words in the devil's mouth, 
or Lucifer's mouth, right? Literally. Literally. Uh, better to, you know, reign in hell than serve in heaven. Okay. But here's the thing. If you're a person of moral weakness, what you are doing fundamentally, and I see we see this happening everywhere, um, is you are creating a hell on earth, calling it heaven, and then mm. claiming that you are God. Mm. Brutus, Cassius, Mark Anthony, Casca, all these people we've been talking about today, even the women, Calpurnia and Portia, they thought they were creating a heaven on earth mm. by removing this man, Caesar, even Caesar, but thought they were creating a heaven on earth by removing uh, this man, Caesar, and instead they created their own hell. There's an idea, a deep idea in theology and philosophy that um, hell is not only the absence of God, but that hell is also what we create ourselves mm -hmm. through our own hubris, through our own lack of, uh, through our own overweening ambition, and of mm -hmm. course all the other sins, by the way sin means miss the mark, all the other ways we miss the mark in connecting with God, connecting mm -hmm. with a higher power, connecting with being. Hmm. Um, if you're Caesar being top dog in a mud puddle that you 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 created, mm -hmm. it's not really a good deal. <laughs> mm -hmm. You don't want to be top dog in a mud puddle. <laughs> um, you also probably don't want to be top dog at the, at the head of the ship of state. You want to well, be placed. He did. With, he did right. You probably want to be placed where the gods seek to place you or God seeks to place you mm -hmm. um, and then maybe because we're going to go ahead a little bit and move ahead here a little bit maybe maybe it might be a good idea to listen to your wife uh, yes back to the book <laughs> back to Julius Caesar act two scene two Caesar speaks uh, it's Caesar and Calpurnia going back and forth. Caesar speaks. What can be avoided whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Well, maybe if you paid attention to them. Yet Caesar shall go forth, for these predictions are to the world in general as to Caesar. Now he's arguing with his wife here, or he's asserting, not arguing, he's asserting to his wife that uh, the dream that she had basically means nothing, right? Um, the dream of his death, the premonition of his death meant nothing. And then Calpurnia responds. She says, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. I love this line. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. The mob means nothing. Their deaths are meaningless. But your death will have meaning. Celestial meaning. Celestial meaning, meaning. <laughs> communicated by the stars. Caesar they responds. will, as it were, see your star in the east. Caesar responds, cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant never taste of death but once. By the way, this is on a lot of freaking things. This is on swords. This is on uh, holsters. This is printed on shirts. People don't know what they're printing on shirts. Be careful. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Leaders don't have the luxury of facilitating pride and arrogance uh, that Caesar is demonstrating here. They don't have that luxury. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, showing that pride and showing that arrogance is a luxury. It's not a right. It's not a virtue. Mm -hmm. um, plus, leaders should probably listen to, not probably, leaders should listen to their wives. And by the way, I'm looking at you, Jeff, and I'm looking at you, Bill. <laughs> I'm looking at both of you. You both would have done better if you listened to your wives. Then Caesar says, what say the augurs? So they're bringing in augurs. Now, for those of you who don't know, augurs were uh, basically entrail readers because there was a belief in the ancient world um, that came out of paganistic uh, practices that you could determine the future. In essence, you could augur the future. You could predict the future by looking at the inside of a dead animal or in some cases the entrails of a dead animal that had been pulled out and arranged in a certain a certain way 
And by the way, this is in all cultures. This wasn't just in Roman culture. They did this in uh, African cultures. They did augury in uh, Native American cultures. Um, and they did augury in Eastern um, and East Asian cultures. Um, so Caesar says, what say the augurers? The servant who's bringing in the information says, they would not have you stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. Caesar responds, the gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart if he should stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I, the elder and more terrible. And Caesar shall go forth. And then Calpurnia has the ironic response here. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. And might he have said, because it's in this play, I am constant as the northern star. <laughs> 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 and fittingly, fittingly in several sentence, in several senses, he then goes to his death. And so he got yeah. what he wanted. He got what he wanted. Caesar till the end. <clears throat> yep, he was Caesar till the end. One of the one of the one of the There's a lot of going back and forth about income inequality in our culture today. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of going back and forth about the nature of what is wealth and who has wealth and who has riches and what's mm -hmm. a fair and equitable distribution of those wealth of that wealth and of those riches to primarily Caesar. Let's be real here. Um, not to you and I, but to Caesar. Mm -hmm. And I pretty much on this one hold to what Jesus said when presented with a coin where he had then asked whose face is on this and the crowd said why it is caesar's and then jesus responds with well then render unto caesar the things that are caesar's and render unto god the things that are god's and then again in my head i imagine him flipping the coin to the pharisees and dropping the mic and uh, walking off um because <laughs> that's a drop the mic kind of line um we have a lot of going back and forth about all of that. What is Caesar? Who is Caesar? Caesar is the government. Caesar is the power of for the power of government backed up by force. The ability to take the ability to send the military or the police to your house and make you submit. Okay. Mm -hmm. If if we have people, according to last count, two thousand two hundred fifty seven billionaires made more money than everybody else in the world in the last mm -hmm. year because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Okay. That leads to arrogance. Forget the number, forget the income inequality, forget all that. I think the bigger issue is not the, the material wealth. I think the bigger issue is the arrogance that people sense underneath that, that sense of being able to be their own Caesars. Mm. Be my own Caesar at Amazon, be my own Caesar at Google, be my own Caesar at Facebook, be my own Caesar at... Toyota, be my own Caesar at John Deere, be my own Caesar at J.P. Morgan, be my own Caesar at Bank of America. I don't have to listen to the little people, quote unquote. I just get to do what I want to do. And by the way, I get to negotiate with all these other Caesars and then go negotiate with the big Caesar. And none of you little people get to be invited into the room. Okay. There's a fundamental tension there that people don't like. Mm -hmm. And people have never liked it. Um... If I run a business, though, and I'm not Amazon, I'm a small business owner. The fact of the matter is this idea of not liking it, of income inequality, of there being something unfair has now filtered into the middle and small businesses. We're seeing this right now in restaurants where people are rejecting jobs at $15 an hour because they are saying, well, that owner is rich and making all that money. He's not Jeff Bezos. And as John McWhorter, the great linguist um, and now New York Times author, would say, um, we have to live in the present. We can't live in the past because no one cares about the past. Um, he also says that richness or wealth is relative to where you are standing. 
So if I'm making $15 an hour, Rich looks like a guy who owns five Dunkin' Donuts franchises. But what the $15 an hour person doesn't understand is the person who owns those five Dunkin' Donuts franchises might be only making $150,000 a year. And half of that's going to Caesar. And he works a lot harder than you well, do. <laughs> but, but there's this conception from the $15 an hour person that that person is not working harder. There's the conception that somehow they are sitting on a pile of gold like Scrooge McDuck. Right. How do we resolve this tension in our republic? Because this, again, is that acid that's seeping down, I think, into small and medium-sized business leaders. And I think you're going to have a revolt among those folks over the next few years because they're tired of getting lumped in. Mm -hmm. They've just about had enough. And these people tend to be, and I'm not putting this in a political context, those people mm -hmm. tend to be apolitical. They tend to be very shrouded. They tend to just shut up and go do their work. I think that that tendency is about to end. Mm. Um, how do leaders deal with this when Caesar's not, not only when Caesar is knocking at the door, but when that conception that uh, you somehow have unearned wealth mm -hmm. is being thrown at them and they know the reality is not, is not the case. Mm hmm. How do leaders deal with that? Well, the right kind of transparency, um, actually, ironically or not, was exemplified by the man who gave his name to this play, um, in that uh, Caesar, Caesar's road to greatness was twofold. One, it was being able to use Rome's uh, political organs to advance his agenda but also it was being literally one of the best generals in history. And he didn't get to be a general because um, he was appointed that way as much as he got to be one because he was a very good soldier. And of course it helped that he was Gaius Julius Caesar, right? That he was one of the Julie, double I, uh, that patrician family, even though they were broke and had been for, I think a couple of centuries, but anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, they're also opportunistic, hence Marius, the plebeian, was part of the same family as Gaius Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, but uh, Caesar uh, exemplified the type of transparency as a leader and that he was, he was the general in the trenches, okay? Uh, and as the eminent historian Paul Johnson wrote in his classic work, Heroes, uh, Gaius Julius Caesar took exemplary care of his men, okay? Mm -hmm. And here I literally mean men. And that is twofold, a bit of an aside. If you look at his behavior to women, mm. forget it, mm -hmm. atrocious, not trying to justify it. Back to how he treated men, okay? These men, his 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 legions, not Rome's legions, his, his legions, legions, okay? Yeah. He trained, he fed, he housed, he disciplined, he led them, okay? He inspired them. He actually gave those little pep talks before battles where they might've been surrounded by Gauls or surrounded by whomever, okay? Always coming out victorious, period, without exception, period, okay? But it didn't end there. He then retired his legions and he helped them found cities where they could then have noble retirement okay this this caesar was loved he was loved by his men they were loyal to him when he crossed that river in northern italy called the rubicon they willingly followed him he led they followed and so uh to the question at hand one of the one of the follow-up questions it begs is, oh, okay, well, can, can they see that leader? What is the leader actually doing? Maybe you just need to take a day shadowing your CEO and see how little time he has to do anything or she has to do anything other than leading mm -hmm. the enterprise and then say, oh, okay, do you want that? <laughs> do you want that? The phone is going off at three in the morning. Do you want that? Do you want that responsibility or do you just want to sleep? Do you want to be, how did he call them? Hold on. I will actually find it because it's in here. How did he call them? Don't worry, I'll find it. It's worth the wait, I promise. Do you want to be like that with the stress making you lose weight or do you want to be 
sleek headed is that what he called them yes, yes. sleek headed men such as sleep at nights do you want to sleep at night do you want to sleep and, and now we'll go to over to jack nicholson right mm -hmm. um did, hold on yeah to jack nicholson and that yep. and a few good men right yep you want to sleep in your bed do you want to sleep comfortably and confidently in your bed with your wife with your children around everybody safe that's happening because i'm here doing what i'm doing Right. I'm doing and the I'm doing the things in the dark that you won't do. <laughs> right. There's not enough of that in the enterprise. Understanding here are the things I do you don't want to do. Um and admittedly there are leaders out there who aren't doing all those things, but their enterprises are gonna crash and burn. You don't have to worry about them. Uh the ones that can stay the course, those people are working ten times harder than you. They're not getting paid and you don't see it, you don't know it. Because Hollywood is telling you something else because that person on social media who seems to know whom you you know who, the source of whose knowledge you never question who just seems to know that oracle that social media oracle is telling you oh this is how this person is compensated that's absurd um and so that type of transparency cesarean transparency that i think would help um, but that's not all. I think turning off the tap of free money would also help um, because then you might understand why you need a job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you have the luxury of, of, of resigning when you don't have to worry where the money comes from to pay your mortgage, to pay your kids school fees, to, to buy them Christmas presents. Yeah, you can you can resign when you're not worried about how you're going to do that. And when you are worried about how you're going to do that, you're going to make different choices. You're going to make different uh, choices. Now, I don't only fault um, the employees, you know, um, where it's, thankfully now more than a decade past where we were uh, with Occupy Wall Street, which I saw in person because I lived and worked in New York at the time, saw it in person, saw it within sight of ground zero, saw it, saw the protests, okay? Um, there's a reason that um, free citizens of a constitutional republic are offended when a certain class of people can profit uh, obscenely, Shakespearean word, okay? Um, while everybody else seems to be going broke okay there's a reason for them to be offended okay um because the nature of that behavior is offensive okay uh it might be legal that doesn't mean that it's moral or virtuous thereby okay we have a system where we only legislate certain things and that allows the maximum latitude for people to use what they are made and what they can come up with to do great things, okay? Does it also necessarily allow for people to figure out how to skirt the rules? Yes, but people are always gonna figure out how to skirt the rules regardless of how many rules there are. That's part of human nature. It's also part of the, pro it's one of the problems of legislation. You can't legislate morality. So you can't come up with a set of rules that people aren't ever gonna break or that only, you know, that the good people will always keep. No, it's absurd. Uh, it's never been the case. Um, and, you know, if you study the history of the Puritans in America, uh, it's a fast that their experiment was a fascinating experiment in um, fleeing a tyranny to then set up another one, <laughs> you know, uh, and in the name of, of not religious freedom. And to their credit, they weren't talking about that. It was their right to do Christianity their way. That's why they left to do that. Okay, great. Um, and that they offended certain people and certain people like Roger Williams, you know, basically were kicked out um, because they didn't want to play by those rules. Um, and to me, the fitting, uh, the fitting, um, not sentence, but the thing that vindicates um, a more moderate position is that as the country grew and as the populace grew, this is still pre 1776, you look at other regions whose populations then surpassed New England's. And it's like, oh, well, were these regions freer in certain ways? Yes, in other ways, absolutely not. There were some were worse, but um, the fact that uh, a more moderate way, and now we're talking the middle Atlantic, a more moderate way led to greater growth. 
Um, I think I think that that's actually beautiful. Um, but anyway, um, I digress as I am wont. And with that, we're wrapping up. At closing. I want to thank DeRolo for coming on the podcast today. This was an excellent conversation that involved history and politics and economics and culture and, of course, leadership. Some thoughts that I have towards the end, and then we're going to discuss how to stay on the leadership path. Only an artist like Shakespeare, and by the way, we didn't get to the death of Caesar here today. That happens in the third act of Julius Caesar, right at the beginning. We didn't get there today. Only an artist like Shakespeare can kill the main character halfway through the play, and it still remains a compelling piece of leadership literature that goes to DiRolo's point about being a narrative and being a dramatist, being a person who could write for Netflix or write for the stage, a true, genuine talent. The turning and transforming of the characters in this play from rogue revolutionaries to trapped and chased criminals occurs in the fourth act of this play. And what happens then, and this is again an amazing turn, is the obverse of what happened in 100 Years of Solitude with Macondo. And it begins to happen with Rome and these guys. Rome moves out of history and reality and into drama. And with that turn, the shades of myth and legend get drawn across the empire. And thus we get to talk about it today. Separated from almost half a millennium now, the play may seem anachronistic. The language, the breaks, the the old English. Yet we still quote from Shakespeare. We still We still quote the words without knowing the provenance or understanding the lessons. Um, Three, two, one, Mark. Separated from Shakespeare, by half a millennia now, the play almost seems anachronistic to our ears from the language and the words to the ideas even in the structure. Yet, we still quote the words from Shakespeare We still quote the words from Julius Caesar without really knowing the provenance of the words or really understanding deeply the ideas. Moral clarity, transparency, how to take the measure of a person, even the importance of having a plan. None of this is new stuff for leaders. This is all embedded in our time and almost taken for granted. The leaders who do best are the ones who pull out what is taken for granted and rebuild it, rethink about it, revisit it in a different kind of way. And they use this revisiting, they use this rebuilding to stay on the leadership path. They use this rebuilding to make sure they don't repeat the same mistakes of the past. And by the way, they use this rebuilding to open their eyes, to stop their own blindness, and to give their followers the ability to see. Well, that's it for me. Dorello, do you have anything for our listeners today? Do you have anything you'd like to promote? Anything you'd like to talk about here at the end of our time? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I haven't come to bury Caesar, but to praise him, as we have been doing for the last hour and 20 minutes. So I'm um, a published author, as uh, I believe uh, Hayson indicated. I wrote a book called... Uh, disruptor in chief why donald trump won and why he will win again and that came out uh, a week before the election in 2020 and i'm currently working on a book that is about uh, the life of liberty under lockdown and because i am ambitious though i'm not caesar um, i'm examining it from multiple the perspective of multiple english speaking nations And the reason is we share a common set, not just a language, but a language that embodies a common set of um, presuppositions, of expectations about how freedom and liberty function and how they function under law 
And I believe that uh, those assumptions have largely been turned on their heads by multiple governments all over the world, but most important to my analysis within the English speaking uh, national family. And so um, I think that uh, we need to address that before it's too late, um, before um, we have more Antonies doing what they're doing. Um, and one of the things that's manifest in Antony that Caesar talks about, that others talk about, uh, was his internal moral corruption. And so um, he, was, he was the best at manipulating the mob. Caesar wouldn't deign to manipulate the mob, neither would Brutus, but Brutus lacked, again, that political vision to see where his honor would lead, not him, but the state. Okay. Anyway, um, I believe we need to begin to examine and address what has been happening um, before we're, we have more Antonys foisted upon us. Um, because uh, the, the life, the lives that we lead, um, they depend on freedoms to do certain things. And uh, I will not take those for granted. I won't take them for granted uh, because literature and history tell me not to take them for granted uh, because they can be taken away, because they can be taken away under pretenses of actually caring for me. And uh, as we know from this play and from other plays, um, the crowd can be swayed one way or another depending on how the winds blow, depending on is the sun shining or is it raining out, the entrails of an animal. That is sophisticated science compared to what direction is the wind blowing? Oh, it's going to rain. <laughs> um, and, so we will. Yeah. We will, so that, we'll that's have... what I'm working on. So um, hopefully um, y'all will lend me your ears when the time comes and buy my book. We'll have Dorola back on the podcast when the book comes out to talk about the book, talk about history, literature, politics um, in the context of the book. If you'd like to stay on the path with us, please visit hsctpublishing.com. Uh, I've written a couple of different books, uh, Marketing for Peace Builders, How to Market Your Value to a World in Conflict, and My Boss Doesn't Care, 100 Essays on Disrupting Your Workplace by Disrupting Your Boss. You can get both of those on Amazon. And I've got the upcoming book in April of 2022, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation for Intentional Leadership, coming out April 2022. Please join my pre-order list by sending me an email, ceo at hsconsultingandtraining.com, or just heading over to the HSCT Publishing website and fill out the contact form if you'd like to join our pre-order list and put it in the subject line, pre-order. If you'd like to check out our leading key solution for training your small and medium-sized business leaders in the tactical and practical rather than the philosophical, the theoretical, or the theological of leadership, go over to leadingkeys.com and check out that website. We're also launching a website, leadershiptoolbox.us, for our cohort-based remote leadership development product, Leadership Toolbox. It has 12 modules of content plus coaching, plus coaching and a certification for you and your team. It takes about four to 12 months to go through the process, and we build relationships with you to make your team better, make your managers and supervisors better, and ultimately make your organization and your culture better. Check out all of our podcasts, this one, of course. Um, and in coming in 2022, we'll have a new podcast, Leader Buzz, the most important leadership headlines of the week inside of 10 minutes. It'll be streaming on YouTube and later on to be released um, as an audio version uh, the same week. So we're launching Leader Buzz in 2022. We're also launching the My Boss Doesn't Care book podcast, a podcast for me talking about the essays in the book, My Boss Doesn't Care, and that will be a limited edition podcast. Only going to do 100 episodes of that one. So check it out at mybossdoesn'tcarepodcast.fm. Finally, social media, you can check us out on all of the socials. We are on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're putting out content in all those spaces. I would encourage you to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel as soon as you finish watching this video. So hit the doodly-doo, 
hit the like, subscribe, share it to your friends. Uh, check out the HSCT Publishing channel on YouTube, as well as the Hayson Sorrells Experience channel on YouTube. And finally, if you'd like to book me directly, and go over to HaysonSorrells.com for booking information. If you'd like to get me to come into your organization to do a keynote or to sit down and have a conversation with folks about the intersections between literature, life, and leadership, or just to be able to answer some questions for you about how you tactically and practically put all of this into play in the world right now. All right, that's it. I'm out.